Hi, I see some familiar faces from Docent Training, and we have some other folks. Happy to have you join us. Today I'm going to talk about Amelia Earhart and her Lockheed Vega. I'm sorry we can't get up close and personal with the Vega right now. You can see it back in the corner here of the Baron Hilton Pioneers of Flight Gallery. Um, we're renovating the gallery, as I think you all know, and that's why this barrier is here. But we have managed to at least put the case with Earhart's artifacts in front of the barrier so people can still see it. And I think the exciting part is that we'll be able to show the Vega as it's being worked on and as the whole gallery is being worked on. Um, the Part of the reason that we're redoing the gallery is that we got a nice generous grant from Baron Hilton um, in, in support of redoing exhibits downtown. So one of the things that we're doing is working on Amelia Earhart's Lockheed Vega, which is the actual Vega in which she crossed the uh, Atlantic Ocean becoming the first woman to solo the Atlantic Ocean in 1932 and becoming only the second person to solo the Atlantic Ocean immediately five years to the day after Charles Lindbergh. So we're taking the opportunity right now to work on the Vega as well as the other aircraft in the uh, gallery. And you can see that we've taken the door off of it. We've removed the cowling on the engine. We've been removed the wheel pants. There's a lot of different things going on with it. And uh, we're just getting to the point of finishing it now. They've done some repair work where the airplane has been run into over the years with different lifts and people doing things in the gallery, uh, cleaned out the engine. Um, and basically, we've been learning more about the aircraft as we pull it apart. We were in there the other day with some of the uh, specialists from Garber, and they said, did you see this handwriting in here? And right inside of the fuselage is some handwriting. Now, I don't know that it's Amelia's, but it's somebody's who wrote a date of 1932, subsequent to her flight, um, probably I think it's more around the, transatlant or the transcontinental flights that she did in this. And you know, I've been in and out of that plane a couple of times over the years and I'd never even noticed this. So this is great to get the technicians in there with actual lights and see what's going on inside. And then the technicians learned something when they took off the cowling and they said, well part of this engine is missing. And I said, well, this isn't the original engine, you know, that she flew the Atlantic in. And they said, well, we didn't know that. And I said, well, that's true, it's not. Because when Amelia flew the Atlantic, she then also set transcontinental records for a woman in the Vega in the summer of 1932. And then she decided to get herself a new Vega. And so she found another one that she took, and, and she removed the engine from this aircraft that she had used for her historic flights because it was a good engine and engines are expensive and the other and she wanted that engine on her new airplane apparently it didn't have as good an engine so they put on a similar engine for this aircraft but it's not the same one that she did the transatlantic and the transcontinental flights in so our people learned something there some of the guys these are the newer guys who didn't work on the airplane when it was first brought into our building back in 1976 so everyone, it's a learning process whenever we work on these aircraft and find out. There's just some, a few parts missing here and there. You know, it's not a working engine, but it's still pretty complete, and we can still call it a nice Pratt & Whitney Wasp engine. So the point is that Amelia Earhart made this dramatic flight in 1932, and what was that all about? Well, it was about getting across the ocean. It was about becoming the first woman to do it. But the greater part of it for Amelia was having a career in aviation. That's what she was interested in. That's what it's all about. Um, women at this time, there weren't that many flying. There were only a, a several, there were several hundred that were certified as pilots. Um, there were enough that had joined this group called the 99s in 1929, that they had 99 of them uh, available back then to start a women's flying corps. So this is several years later, and there's several hundred more women by then. But most of the women are not doing aviation full-time. There's only a small group. And from the time that Amelia became a pilot, she wanted to earn a living in aviation. Avi she could still, she immediately started setting records when she received her, uh, her first uh, license in 1922. She set altitude records. She started flying uh, and other things such as the Women's Air Derby in 1929. Of course, in 1928, she became the first woman to fly across the Atlantic Ocean in an aircraft, although she never touched, touched the controls of that Fokker friendship in the, the summer of 1928. Two male pilots flew her across the ocean then, 
But still, that was enough of a sensation that she became a big media star, and that was kind of her entree then into be, to establishing an aviation career. From that notoriety, she could move on and insert herself into other parts of aviation. She became part of the NAA, the National Aeronautic Association. She started working with other companies to promote aircraft. One of the early things that she did was fly the Pitcairn Autogyro, which was a whole new technology in aviation, short field takeoff. Um, and they wanted her because she had a name. She wanted them because this was a product and something that she could demonstrate across the country and get publicity. And it all worked together. After her 1928 flight as a passenger, her manager, um, George Palmer Putnam, uh, set up lectures, set up dinners for her, set up things across country so that she could lecture. And then she could do more flights, and then she could lecture again. And that's basically how she set her career up. She said, I make the records. First I make the records, and then I lecture on them. So then she were, was in the Women's Air Derby in 1929. She came in third in that. Louise Thaden actually won the Air Derby. Um, but that was the first uh, large transcontinental race that women were allowed on, the first one that ever had a uh, purse, a, a prize money for them, something that really legitimized women as being able to fly long, hard, cross-country flights, segments that took over a week for them to do it. Uh, landing at different airports across the country until they got to Cleveland to the Cleveland Air Races. And Amelia was proud to be part of that along with the other women. And most of the women in that derby, they were like Amelia who were trying to establish careers in an area that's totally dominated by men where women are not considered being able to fly and why would they want to have a career in aviation anyway. So these are the women who were a little different at the time. They wanted to fly, they were interested in aviation and they did whatever they could. They flew uh, for records, they flew for prizes, they flew for aircraft companies, they lectured, they made public appearances, they worked with other aviation groups and organizations to promote air-mindedness, which was also going to play into their hands. The more that women can show that flying is something that women can do, then other people will accept it, and it becomes a form of transportation then that the general public might try in terms of the airlines. This is the time when the airlines are just getting established, and they're moving from just having airmail contracts into actually taking people across country and in trying to get people to get into airplanes and fly across country. So the women are trying to help in that and the airlines are interested in have the women, having the women help them. It's all a matter of working together to promote a aviation. Uh, after her 1932 flight, uh, which was about a little over a 2,000 mile flight, she left from Harbor Grace, Newfoundland uh, on May 20th, 1932 in um, Londonderry, Ireland in a farmer's field and she landed after she did that flight and she became this big sensation then she was able to continue to promote herself she was able to prove that women had the courage to be able to make this type of flight and to go ahead and establish this career that she really wanted and then she took it on to other avenues she did a lot of writing she wrote in National Geographic, she wrote in Cosmopolitan, she wrote in other aviation magazines, she wrote for the National Aircraft uh, Aeronautics Association, she promoted women in the uh, Aeronautic Association by uh, uh, having them offer women's records so that women just starting to learn to fly could compete against each other before they went up against world records and, and men's records. Um, she uh, worked in reaching women in different avenues by going first of all to Purdue University uh, where she helped uh, talk to young women who were in technical fields there. The uh, president of Purdue was very interested in getting women into engineering, into science. He wanted to see them educated. He's interested in promoting women's careers and she went there as an advisor so she sought out the young women there to try to help them. Um, she continued to seek out other women by doing fashion. She actually had a line of fashion clothing and that got her name out there and it gave her some legitimacy with other women in women's magazines, in women's stores around the country. She started out with a casual line of clothing and also went into dresses and coats. So there was a back and forth there working with women and about with women, getting her name out in the public eye. Um, she also had a line of luggage that she designed. So there's another avenue of getting out to people and earning a living in aviation. She tried all these different little areas that she could use. Just not unlike what sports stars and other 
you know, perform, uh, heroes of today will do. Well, they market themselves and they're marketing their sport or their film or whatever they're marketing. Um, this was the way that she was able to really have the most successful career of any woman in aviation at that time and, of course, make a name for herself that is still known today. Now, some of that, of course, uh, her notoriety uh, comes from being lost in 1937 on the Around the World flight. And that's not to be, you know, denied. Um, if she had made the world flight, she would still be very popular, but it wouldn't be like it is today where everyone's still running around trying to solve the greatest mystery of the 20th century, where's Amelia, what happened to Amelia? I just had a, yet another uh, letter from another uh, student in school who asked me all the, the usual questions about where is she and what happened and what might have happened and where do I think she is and I answered them yet again just kind of print out the same letter but you know I'm, I'm always discovering new things too and uh, there are a lot of good books out there that talk about it there are a lot of books out there that I don't believe in uh, so it, it, you can take your look at the literature and decide for yourself um, after her flights in this uh, aircraft like I say the uh, non-stop crossing the Atlantic Ocean in May 1932 and then a transcontinental record in July of 1932. She did sell this aircraft. She went on to fly in other races and do other things and then she acquired yet another uh, Vega and in 1935 she flew that Vega from Hawaii to the mainland to California and she became the first woman to do that solo. Now it had been done before by other people but not solo. So she's establishing these solo records and then she took her second Vega and also flew that, or the, the last Vega, the 5C Vega, which is just a different engine. She also flew that from Mexico City up to Newark. So in 35, she's continuing this whole idea of staying in the public limelight, setting records and continuing on. And then in 1937, she was able to acquire the Lockheed Electra, which was paid for mostly by Purdue University and plan this round the world flight. And of course she started the flight in early spring of 1937 in Honolulu and did a ground loop on takeoff. So the Electra needed to come back to California and be refurbished. And then she took off again going the other direction, flew to Florida and was going to go around the world, Florida, back around to California that way. And she flew for about a month and on the next to last leg, the leg from Ley, uh, New Guinea to Howland Island, she was lost and never seen again. Um, when we redo this exhibit here, we're going to talk about that, about some of the issues as to what happened to her, why she didn't make it. We're going to talk about all these other issues. I talked about her as a, as a salesperson for herself, as a salesperson for aeronautics, as a salesperson for women and careers and education. All that's going to be put into our new exhibit. And uh, we've got a lot of new photographs, we've got some new artifacts, but we're also going to keep these artifacts that you see over here. Someone asked about the chest that we had acquired recently from her niece. Um, that is in storage right now, we'll bring that back out and I'm going to put a trophy or two in it. Just get the idea of why did she have this beautiful chest that was a beautiful hand carved chest that was specifically made for her and uh, designed actually by her husband. Um, so we're going to show what the practical use of that was. Um, we're going to have of some films in the era of the era that will show her and the Lindberghs and other people like that when this whole gallery is renovated. It's a whole idea of, of trying to make a, a better use of the gallery, the aircraft that are here, why are they important, who are the people behind them, and what does it mean to the history of aviation. And this is the era when people are doing the record setting, when they're trying to get air mindedness out there, they're trying to get people into commercial airliners. The military is learning what to do with aircraft and how to fly them around the world, how to make use of them as military aircraft, as uh, pursuit aircraft, as transport aircraft. There's a whole thing going on here of pioneering and we're going to expand upon that greatly from the old gallery that was here. Another thing to point out is that this spring there is a movie coming out called Night at the Museum 2 and that will feature Amelia Earhart in the Lockheed Vega. So actually uh, some of it was actually shot in this building and then the movie company also made a uh, three-quarter I believe it is size model of the Lockheed Vega and they used it extensively in a sound, sound stage up in Vancouver where the uh, film was also shot. So we're going to get our name in the papers we hope and get a lot of people excited about Amelia and uh, so, you know it's a little unfortunate that the gallery won't be open for that premiere but come back in a, another year and it'll be open. May 2010 we'll have it open.
Thank you for listening to this edition of Ask an Expert. A companion question and answer session for this lecture may also be available. For a schedule of upcoming Ask an Expert lectures at the museum, please visit www.nasm.si.edu.